Welcome to PCR 2016. My name is Alex Abizaid. I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I'm very fortunate to have Ian Meredith from uh, Melbourne, Australia, to discuss in a very hot topic on bioabsorber scaffolds from dissolve to amity. So Ian, thank you so much for joining. Uh, you know that recently the FDA panel uh, approved uh, absorbing the United States. Do you think this is a, a good momentum for us to discuss uh, current indications for bioabsorber scaffolds? Do you think that this is going to change our practice just by the fact that uh, it's going to be available in the US? Well, first, Alex, let me thank you for uh, having me join you on the, this chat because I think it's very important. And the short answer to what you just said is yes, I think uh, finally we've got the umpire's decision, the ball has been bounced, the game is in play, and uh, uh, I think now it's time not to, to, to criticise the decision but to move on and accept that uh, BRS technology are going to be an important part of percutaneous interventional coronary procedures in the future. It's up to us to actually make the, uh, the, the best possible uh, solution going forward. So I, I think it's, uh, it's of monumental importance that the FDA actually approved uh, the technology. So Ian, we are still talking about first generation BRS devices. Mm. Do you think as, as we expand to different indications, such as, for instance, acute MI patients, that you know there is some limitations with the current metallic platforms. You know, mm -hmm. there's thrombus behind, there's sizing issue. Do you think that uh, the more futuristic next generation BRS mm -hmm. will be applicable for this special situation? Yeah, uh, so look, I, I think there's two parts to that question. Is that the, there's definitely a role for iteration of the devices and you've been at the forefront of device iteration, particularly BRS. So I think we're going to see better and better devices. And then when you have better and better devices, that there's the opportunity such there is with Elixir now to, to uh, create a specific uh, platform uh, in fields like myocardial infarction. And a as you mentioned, uh, MI is a difficult thing because we often undersize the uh, device. Simply there's vasoconstriction and uh, neurohumeral influences and thrombus and we don't necessarily get the size right and then of course uh, later you realize there's considerable malapposition of the uh, metallic stent because there's no self-expanding capability or remodeling capability. So this is a potentially very important field and one that might be perfectly suited uh, to a BRS technology. For some reason, Ian, people doesn't seem to embrace so easily self-expanding metallic stent for mm -hmm. that application, yeah. right? So, because in the beginning I thought that the, there is potential for metallic self-expanded uh, stent for that uh, particular uh, situation. What's your reaction to that? So, look, I think you're absolutely right. People haven't embraced that. There is a high risk of uh, uh, restenosis and thrombosis. But as you know, Alex, in the Apposition 2 study, which was a randomised trial of a standard metallic DES versus a self-expanding uh, stent, in the context of myocardial infarction, when they did three-day angiograms and OCT and IVUS, mm -hmm. they showed that there was considerably less malapposition uh, with the self-expanding. We already know is that we tend to under under deploy yes. uh, devices in AMI. So, and then you have the inherent problems with the self-expanding metal stent. So that's why I think that that signal that we got out of Apposition Two mm -hmm. probably tells us that there is a role for a uh, remodeling, if you mm -hmm. wish. Uh, uh, BRS technology. Yeah. So, so I obviously can summarize a little bit uh, the long-term data on, on Dissolve NX, which we recently presented here at PCR, the, the three-year clinical and imaging data, which looks excellent in terms of uh, sustained lumen gain that we achieved at six months, and of course, very low rates of MACE, less than 10% of the end of uh, three years. But what is so special about the future, future technology on, on Dissolve? Dissolve CX and Dissolve MT, which is you know, particularly designed for, to, to treat acute MI patients. Well, first, I congratulate you on those, those results because they're very important. And, and you've clearly shown the world that uh, uh, the Dissolve technology does lead to uh, uh, an increased lumen dimensions over time, which is very important, suggesting that there is some positive remodeling and uh, gain in lumen size. 
CX, as you know, is, uh, is a different version to the Dissolve uh, original platform. It has uh, less strut height. It's uh, 120 as opposed to 150 microns. Mm -hmm. So there are some distinct advantages. We've discussed these, you and I, numerous times. And uh, the Amity platform is uh, a myocardial specific, my myocardial infarction specific technology. And that will have this uh, shape memory uh, this ability to remodel, to, uh, to deal with any malapposition issues, uh, much like the way we saw uh, self-expanding metal stents do that. So share with us a little bit of uh, uh, the very first man study on AMT, which is supposed to be a more mechanistical one with OCT yeah. and, and, and more imaging. So that's exactly right. I think that the plan, Alex, is to a mechanistic study take the opportunity to review the patients on day three. So come in with an ST elevation MI, randomised to a standard drug eluting metal stent mm -hmm. or the Amity uh, technology. Nice randomised, properly randomised control trial and then actually have the primary endpoint malapposition at three days. Just to ask that and answer that question, can we actually show definitively in a small randomised study that there is uh, uh, less malapposition with a shape memory designed uh, elixamity than the metal stent. And we've got the control data already from apposition too, so we know what the rate would actually be. But this is only the start. I suppose I'd ask you, you know, you've done lots of clinical trials. Even if you had that information, where would you take it, Alex? Yeah. You know, Ian, I think that uh, consistent data with OCT is convincing me more and more that if you have this so-called self-correction feature of the dissolved amity, I will be very much enthusiastic of, of, of using this device for, for acute MI patients. It's probably not going to be the definitive answer. We're going to need larger randomized trial and perhaps the control arm it will be you know, the, the usual metallic uh, stent. But I have to say that with a good number of patients with OCT showing that between 48 and 72 hours, when all this, uh, as you well described, this, this all phenomenon of uh, vasoconstriction and, and thrombus, presence of thrombus, yeah. that everything is going to resolve in these first few days. And if this device can really have a good apposition and show good apposition by OCT, I'm going to be very enthusiastic about that. And of course, uh, to change any uh, guidelines, we're going to need a larger trial. But I think that's good news. I think so. I think it is. It's, uh, and as you know, what we know thus far from all of the collective information that's been gathered from the BRS field is the events often occur early in the first 30 days, uh, mm -hmm. uh, stent thrombotic events. Mm -hmm. So if it is that by having a shape memory and self-correction uh, that you can overcome the malapposition that might be leading mm -hmm. uh, to the problem, this, this is going to be huge. So Ian, do you think it's fair to conclude saying that the field of bioabsorber scaffold is evolving very rapidly after the first generation that set the stage? We feel very comfortable about efficacy, but we all agree that there is room for improvement in terms of safety. And I think that with the next generation, lower profile, good radio force, and the potentially the self-correction feature will perhaps increase the utility of this device in the near future. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. All of those uh, structural and uh, changes to the device that uh, lend them uh, to be used in more specific situations is going to be a huge advance. And I think now we have the FDA approval uh, and it, it will be part of the future. Uh, we, we've got this tremendous opportunity to improve. And I think uh, the AMI population is a very good one to go after if uh, self-correction works. But it will take mm. a big study to yeah. prove that this means something. Thank mm. you so much, Ian. And please stay tuned for the next generation BRS devices, for MI, eventually for small vessels, and other situations, mm. difficult situations that we find in our clinical practice. With the next generation, I'm very convinced that we're going to be able to increase the use of BRS technology in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ian. Thanks, Alex. Thanks.